This is Coding Math. I'm Keith Peters, and this is episode 4, Circles, Ellipses, and Lissajous Curves. Now, in previous videos, we've covered sine, cosine, and tangent, and gone over a few useful examples on how to use sine to animate objects. In those examples, you could easily have swapped out cosine for sine and not noticed any real difference. Again, sine and cosine create identical waves. They're just out of phase with each other. In the first example there, we had an object animating up and down like this. By changing just a couple of lines, you can get it to move back and forth on the x-axis instead. So we'll just change this to use center x rather than center y and apply that to the x-axis. In this video, we'll look at how to get an object animating in more interesting paths than a straight line. First, we'll try a circle. The object will start out over here at zero degrees, and we'll move around the circle, hitting various points like this. Now let's interpose some coordinates on this picture. And if we draw the radius to the position of the object at a certain point, we start to see something interesting. We can easily turn this into a right triangle, and now the scene should look very familiar if you've seen episode two or three. Now let's label the sides of this triangle. The hypotenuse is actually the radius of the circle. The adjacent side happens to be the position of the object on the x-axis. The object is over here, this distance from zero on that axis. Likewise, the opposite side is the position of the object on the y-axis. So, if we could figure out what the lengths of those two sides are, we would know where to draw the object at that angle around the circle. Well, we know that the cosine of this angle is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. In this case, that means x over the radius. And the sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse, or y divided by radius. Now we can do a little bit of algebra. We multiply both sides of the equations by r. The r's then cancel out on this side, and you're left with x equals r cosine a, and y equals r sine a. We'll be defining angle A, and we can use math sine and cosine functions to get that part of it. We'll also be defining the radius, so we have everything we need to know to calculate x and y. I'll also just point out that the x and y here are relative to the center of that circle. You'll need to define where that center is as well. On the canvas, this point up here will be 0, 0. So you might define a point cx, cy to be the center of that circle. This distance here would be cx, and this would be cy. So the final position of the object would be cx plus x and cy plus y. Now all you have to do is continue to increment this angle, apply the same formula, and draw the object at the new position calculated on each iteration. So for this point, for example, you'd have a triangle like this. And the angle would be from here to here. Applying the same formula would give you this x and this y, which would tell you where to draw the object at that angle. Okay, time for some code. We'll start with the usual HTML document, which creates a canvas element and loads the circle.js file. As usual, refer back to episode 1 if you have any questions on the setup of either the HTML or the JavaScript files. First, we'll create variables for center x and center y. We'll set those so that the center of the circle is the center of the canvas. Then we'll need to define radius, angle, speed, and a final x and y. Then we'll call and create a render function. This will first clear the screen, then calculate the x and y values based on the formula we just discussed. It then draws a circle at that final x, y point and increments the angle for the next time around. Finally, it calls request animation frame as we discussed in episode three. We can test that and sure enough, we have this object going around in a circle. Now to do an ellipse, all we need is a different quote-unquote radius for each angle. We'll change the single radius variable to x radius and y radius and give them different values. Then in the render function, we'll use x radius when calculating the x position and y radius when calculating the y position. And now we have an object moving around in an elliptical pattern. Now you can make one minor change that will result in some very interesting, almost chaotic looking motion. Right now the object is moving back and forth at the same rate that it's moving up and down. And because the two are 90 degrees out of phase, we get a circle. But what if they were moving at different rates? What kind of shape would we get? 
Well, let's try it and find out. In the same way that we change radius to separate the values for each axis, we'll create separate values for angle and speed. Call them x angle, y angle, x speed, and y speed. The angles can both start at zero, but the speeds will be different. We'll use the x versions when calculating the x position and the y versions for the y position. You can run this and see a very interesting result. Here the oscillation on the x-axis is completely out of sync with the oscillation on the y-axis. So it seems like this object is randomly flying around the screen, although the motion is actually completely deterministic. The shape it's forming is called a Lisa Zhu curve. This might be useful for animating a fly or a bee hovering around. Here's a simple animation of several objects flying around with the same formula, but different values for x-speed and y-speed. Now, going back to circles, we can also use the same basic formulas to lay out objects in a circular arrangement. Let's go back to the original code we had for animating the circle. Since we won't be animating this time, we can get rid of the render function. Later we'll replace it with a simple for loop. We can get rid of the speed variable for the same reason. Instead, we'll need to know two things. First, how many objects to create. Let's say 10 to start with. We'll store that in a variable called numobjects. Next, what angles do we need to place these objects at as we go around the circle? If we're working with degrees, you could easily divide 360 by 10 objects, and you know that you need to place one object every 36 degrees. In the code, we'll be working with two pi radians, which is equivalent to 360 degrees. So we'll make another variable called slice and set that to 2 pi divided by the number of objects. Now we can create a for loop. We'll loop through num object times. Each time we'll set the angle variable to i times slice. From there on we can just use the same code we had before to calculate the x and y positions and draw an object at each point. And here's the result. Note that we can now easily add more objects by changing the numobjects variable. Since everything else is based on that, it all just works. Let's try changing it to 20. And there you have 20 objects perfectly arranged around a circle. So that's it for this episode. Next time we'll look at the tangent function and a very useful related function, math atan2.